All right. Welcome, everyone, to Innovative in Education's Organic Chemistry Series. This is Lecture 12, and my name is Mike Evans. And today you'll be learning about conformations of cyclohexane and conformational analysis of the cyclohexanes, as well as a little bit of stereochemistry more towards the end of the session. So whether you're watching this live or recorded, hopefully you'll learn something about the conformations of cyclohexane, a particularly special cycloalkane today. So before we got to that, I wanted to just review a little bit of what we talked about last time. Last time, we looked at ring strain in the small cycloalkanes. So we looked at the two kinds of ring strain as angle and eclipsing strain. So angle strain, common in, for instance, the cyclopropanes, has to do with the fact that bond angles in the small rings are non-ideal. So they're very far from the 109.5 degrees that we would like for the cycloalkanes to have. As a result, they're substantially higher in energy than you would initially predict, and we can harness that high energy species to do chemical work for us, so to do chemical reactions like addition and hydrogenation, which we saw last time. We also, last time, were introduced to a cycloalkane that exhibits no strain whatsoever. And what, the, what that means, the consequence of that, is what you're seeing right here. Cyclohexane is roughly equal in energy to its open chain form, hexane. We looked in a little bit of detail at the three-dimensional structure of cyclohexane, and hopefully by now you're comfortable with drawing cyclohexane chairs, which represent the cyclohexane ring in three dimensions, as you can see here. And looking at the three-dimensional structure, of the cyclohexane ring, we saw some pretty interesting stuff going on. So we noted that there are two different kinds of substituents on the cyclohexane ring. Going straight up and down, we have these axial substituents, those are labeled with A, and pointing more out towards the sides of the cyclohexane ring, we have the, the equatorial substituents, which are here labeled E for you. And those two kinds of substituents are actually stereochemically unique. So in other words, a molecule with a substituent on the A position, say this A position right here, is not the same as a molecule with that same substituent at the E position. Now what we're going to see today is that those two forms, at least for monosubstituted cyclohexanes, are able to interconvert. But we'll get to that in a little bit. All right, so what you're looking at here is this process of conformational dynamics that goes on in cyclohexanes. So you're looking at the two chair forms at the top of this slide of cyclohexane. And what you'll notice is that one chair kind of leans one way and the other chair kind of leans the other way. Right? And so these two chairs are distinct from each other stereochemically, first of all. We recognize the difference between this structure and this structure in the fact that they can't be superimposed on one another. But they are interconvertible by a conformational process. So we haven't talked too much about conformational changes, but things like bond rotation and vibration, translation of molecules, are all examples of conformational changes that don't affect the connectivity of a molecule or even necessarily its energy in a huge way, but do result in a different molecule, a different molecular shape based on that rotation or vibration of the molecule. So what you're looking at is the so-called chair flip of cyclohexane. So what you'll notice is that the carbon with the hydroxyl substituent right here goes from pointing sort of upward, kind of going up this way, to pointing downward. And when it points downward, the hydroxyl substituent goes from pointing kind of out towards the outside as an equatorial substituent, now down, straight down in axial position. So in this conformational process, we've essentially changed the hydroxyl substituent from equatorial to axial. And you'll notice here that I've written that these are diastereomers, which they are. They're non-superimposable mirror images. And you'll remember from our discussion of the energetics of stereoisomerism, that diastereomers have different energies. That's interesting in this case because that means that conformation, uh, conformational changes 
are changing the energy of the molecule. So we can ask the question, which of these two conformations is more stable? The one with the group in the equatorial position or the one with the group in the axial position? You may have some ideas about that already, but in a little bit we'll look at that in excruciating detail. Now, you may have the question as well, how does this process happen? How does the cyclohexane ring go from being sort of leaning one way to leaning the other? And you may have some intuitive ideas about this as well. So you can notice that just as this is pointing down in this structure and pointing up over here, we probably need to take that carbon and somehow kind of flip it down as a part of the conformational process. And that's definitely part of it. All right, so look, let's look at this process in a little more detail now. So the chair flip process is shown for you here. And basically, the two chairs are shown right here. And various intermediates along the pathway are shown throughout here for you. So the first chair you can see there has the hydroxyl group in an equatorial position. And what happens is that one end of the cyclohexane ring kind of folds up and eventually reaches a point where it's actually above the plane on the same side as the other carbon, uh, three carbons away. At that point, we have the boat conformation right here. So going through this sort of half chair where we have four, uh, four carbons in a plane and that one carbon sticking up, that third carbon continues on and eventually we end up at this boat conformation, which is actually a transition state of this process. We then go on to a, another half chair where we start pulling down the other side and uh, Finally, we get to the other chair. So what I wanted to do is actually demonstrate this process with a real model. So doing that, we see here is a real-life model of cyclohexane for you. You can see the carbon pointing down here, carbon pointing up over here. To do the chair flip, we take one carbon, start moving it downward. Here we've reached the half-chair state where we have five of the atoms in a plane and one sticking out of the plane, in this case it's sticking downward, and then we continue moving that on, and here we have the boat conformation. We do the same on the other side, there's the half chair, and there's the full chair, and we've now interconverted the cyclohexane from one conformational isomer to another. Alright, so that shows you the process in terms of shape, what does it look like in terms of energy? So energetically, the process looks something like this. We start out at one chair. Notice that the two chairs have different energies, and that's key. We go through an energy increasing process getting to the half chair as we fold it up. And then we actually go down a bit in energy when we get to the boat, slightly back up in energy to get to the half chair. So the two half chairs are diastereomeric, and so they may have different energies. And finally, after that second half chair, let's say it's a little bit higher in energy than the first one, we get to the second chair, which actually, because it's a diastereomer of the first compound, as you can see at the top here, those two conformers have different energies. And so we end up at a different place than where we started. And we'll see diagrams like this where we place intermediates and transition states on a graph as a function of energy and reaction progress in chapter four when we talk about um, reactive intermediates and modeling reactions.